introduction of Philippians chapter 3 this morning. Philippians chapter 3. If you don't have a Bible with you, we encourage you to take one there in the pew and turn with us. Philippians chapter 3 can be found on page 1014. 1014, Philippians chapter 3. Well, we made it today. When Mike said, welcome back, I, I had flashbacks to the late 70s, early 80s, and welcome back, Cotter, if, for those of you that remember that show, and uh, that, was a, that was a wild one. Um, welcome back, though. We're glad to be together again um, on Sunday morning. We have been here on Wednesday nights, um, and so it's for some that were able to be here, it's not as foreign, but for some of us, man, we had to use our GPS to get here today, you know, and, and uh, but... You know, when we talked about our theme being refreshed this year, I didn't mean refreshed from church. <laughs> I was talking about at church. So, um, you know, when we were praying for this week, too, and, you know, earlier on in the week, of course, you know, they drama on the, the newscast, you know, they're like, oh, there could be an Alberta Clipper this weekend again. And I just said this prayer. I said, Lord, you know what day it is, and you create the weather. So please. <laughs> give us Sunday. <laughs> You're in charge of that, so please take care of it. We're here, and we're glad to be here. Um, now, somebody suggested this week, they said, you know, Pastor, we, we love your preaching so much that perhaps you should do the last two weeks and this week's all this morning. And I said, that's awesome. So I think we're going to stick around till 2, and then we'll have a break for, for, for some food, and then we'll come back and we'll do the three Sunday nights. Okay, we'll just get it all out of the way. And I know that you're all excited about that. And uh, we won't do that, I promise. Um, I will have to talk fast, or you can listen fast, however you want to do it this morning. Uh, but I do want to say this. I know uh, we weren't able to experience their work necessarily, but uh, Brother Mike Graver and Aaron Manus and his boys uh, came up. And uh, both weeks we were out, they were here and were planning. The first week they did clean everything off, but it just was bad timing with the storm. It was just storming even into um, Sunday school time. But last week, they were here at 6 a.m. throwing salt down and trying to get it ready, and uh, it just kept refreezing even over the salt. And so um, I just want to say thank you to them. Um, their labors weren't in vain because I know the school, the academy, benefited from it greatly uh, because the sidewalks were cleared all the way down to the school and so thank you, uh, guys, and your families for, for doing that for us and trying uh, to make it possible for us to meet to get together. And we're back together, though, today, and I'm thankful for it. So this, uh, this month <laughs> was supposed to be a series of messages called Wanted. Uh, you remember the Wanted posters, right? And uh, there was a wanted poster, you know, with a face on it, and there was a reward offered. But there are so many things in, in, in our life that we want or that we seek after but they seem almost um, unreachable, like they're just outside of our grasp. And we listen to other people in the world talk about how they're filled with joy and how they're happy and satisfied and fulfilled and they're just in love with Jesus. And every time they come to church, they feel this warm embrace. And, and sometimes, you know, we feel that way, but other times we think, I just, I don't understand that. Uh, there's a new fad going around, I, I don't know if I'm saying it right, it's called Con Marie or Cone Marie. How many of you know what I'm talking about? Okay, all of you that watch HGTV, okay. Um, there's this lady who has uh, taught us how to organize our lives. And she tells us that if we will only keep the things, tell me if I'm wrong, friends, if, if you got this right, that spark joy. And I thought, well, that, that's inspiring. So I'll get rid of my toothbrush. I'll get... Um, I'll get rid of my mortgage payment. Um, man, these are all things. I'll just throw them out, you know. If I'm, if I'm only keeping what sparks joy, and, and, and the whole idea is to organize your life and, and get rid of those things. I get it. But, you know, we walk around through life, and we're like, I want that constant contentment, satisfaction, purpose, accomplishment, joy in life. And those are things that we want. And, and they're not necessarily things you can buy or add or, or make someone else give you. They really come from within. And so this week, or supposed to be three weeks ago, we're going to look at this idea of purpose. Purpose. One of golf's immortal moments came 
when a Scotchman demonstrated the game for the first time in the United States to President Ulysses S. Grant. The man carefully placed the golf ball on the tee, and this never happened to some of you, but it's happened to me before. He placed the golf ball on the tee, he steps back, does his little wiggle like they do, and he takes a mighty swing. The club made contact with the dirt, the grass. Dirt went flying everywhere, and the story goes it even landed in Grant's beard. And it covered the people all around him. The man was embarrassed, and he kind of stepped back and, and took, as the story goes, six more swings and never made contact with the ball. He was so nervous about showing off this new sport that he missed every time. Well, President Grant replied after patiently waiting through all these swings, there seems to be a fair amount of exercise in the game, but I fail to see the purpose of the ball. <laughs> now, you can take that, and that's kind of a picture of us in this world sometimes as Christians. We try to introduce this concept of ourselves, of our God, of our church, of our Bible to the world, and we have everything set up perfectly. And we have all the tools at our disposal. We understand how it's all supposed to work. And we're swinging. And there's a lot of activity in our lives. We're doing a lot, but we're missing the most important thing. That is, the main reason God placed us on this earth. So many distractions in this world take us away from priority, don't they? They take us away from the main purpose that God has us here. And you know, we'd be wise to keep in mind that someday this life will be over. And when it is, the question is, what will be left when we stand before God? God created us, listen, God created us for His pleasure and for a relationship with Him. He didn't want worship worshipers to be an aloof group that distantly stands back and just recognizes that there's a God and that he's in control. No, he wants a real connection with his creation. And I asked this question this morning for all of us to answer, is what I am currently living for accomplishing the purpose of knowing God in a relationship with him. Knowing God and making him known. Knowing God and glorifying him. Is what I am living for accomplishing that purpose. And this morning we're going to see the most fulfilling purpose in this life. Aren't you curious? What is the most fulfilling? Because if it's there and I can have it, I want it. So let's look at it. Philippians chapter 3. Paul gives us a little insight here as to uh, what is the purpose of this life why does God have us here so Philippians 3 we're going to read verses 1 through 11 he says finally my brethren rejoice in the Lord to write the same things to you to me indeed is not grievous but for you it is safe beware of dogs beware of evil workers Beware of the concision, for we are the circumcision which worship God in the Spirit and rejoice in Christ Jesus and have no confidence in the flesh, though I might also have confidence in the flesh. If any other man thinketh that he hath whereof he might trust in the flesh, I more. Circumcised the eighth day of the stock of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, and Hebrew of the Hebrews, as touching the law, a Pharisee. Concerning zeal, persecuting the church. Touching the righteousness which is in the law, blameless. But what things were gained to me, those I counted loss for Christ. Yea, doubtless, and I count all things but loss for the excellency of, knowing, of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord. 
for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and do count them but dung, that I may win Christ, and be found in him, not having mine own righteousness, which is of the law, but that which is through the faith of Christ, the righteousness which is of God by faith, that I may know him, and the power of his resurrection, and the fellowship of his sufferings, being made conformable unto his death, if by any means I might attain unto the resurrection of the dead. Let's pray this morning. Our Heavenly Father, we're grateful to be here today. Lord, we thank you for providing weather that would allow us to gather and uh, to serve and to worship you. And now, Lord, as we turn our attention to your holy word, I ask that we would uh, listen with our spiritual ears, that we will hear what you are saying, and as your word and your spirit touch our hearts, whether it's through conviction or correction or instruction or encouragement. However, Lord, you speak to us today, I pray that we would hear and respond, Lord, that we may know you, that it'll be our desire, that our greatest purpose in this life will be to please you and to know you even greater. And we ask these things in Jesus' name, amen. All right, so Paul says, here's, here's the purpose, here's, here's what I live for, Paul says, and he, and he begins, he's closing out the letter, that's why it says finally in, in verse 1. He, he's closing out his letter to the church at Philippi, and he says, finally, brothers, uh, rejoice in the Lord. Now there is a statement that he ends with a period, rejoice in the Lord, period. The very first priority we have to have, the, the most proper priority in this life is to rejoice in the Lord, we all want to rejoice. We all want joy. We all want that, that inner satisfaction that even though the world around us may be awful, inside we have joy and, and have it consistently, not just as our circumstances make us happy. Look what he says here. Rejoice in the Lord. You know, we can always, we can always rejoice in the Lord. Doesn't he say to do that? He commands us, rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say, rejoice. How can I do that? Well, listen, the Lord's love for us is unprecedented. We've never seen anything like it. His love for us doesn't make sense. You know, it's not the kind of love that we know and give. The kind of love that we know and give is conditional. But Jesus died while we were yet sinners. So this is something we can rejoice in the Lord in because while I'm yet a sinner, Christ died for me. He took my sin and my sorrow. The, and the song says he made them his very own. He shed his blood to pay for my sins. He was forsaken by his father so that I would never have to be. Are you hearing this this morning? See, these are reasons that we can rejoice in the Lord no matter what's going on in our life. No matter if we find like ourselves, like Paul, writing this letter from prison. For, for preaching the gospel, he found himself in prison. And whether I'm in prison of, of, a, of a physical cell, or whether I'm in the prison of bad health, or the prison of bad finances, or the prison of a horrible relationship, or the prison of a bad job environment, no matter where I find myself, I can rejoice in the Lord. He showed me favor. He showed you favor, friend, by letting you hear the gospel, the good news. Hey, if you're here today, do you realize that God has smiled on you? And it's not because, you know, of anybody here. It's because of Jesus and the message that he has for you. He's got a word for you today, and it's to be saved, to trust Christ. And he's shown you favor by letting you hear the good news. I don't know about you, but he worked on my heart until I believed and trusted him. And I didn't get saved the first time I was convicted. Some maybe did. 
But, but people I talked to, usually it was a while after they heard the gospel a couple times, and God continued, didn't he? He continued to work on our hearts. He didn't give up. He didn't offer it to us one time and say, do you believe? And he said, no, I don't, fine, I'm moving on to somebody else. No, he's blessed us to hear it over and over and over. You know, he's, by his spirit, he came to personally dwell with me forever. The Bible tells me that he's in heaven preparing a place for me. For me, you know, for you if you're saved. There's a spot for you. He's coming again, the Bible says, to receive me to himself. He's coming back for me. You know, I'll be with him forever. And all of that because he loves me. Now, brothers and sisters, friends, look, it doesn't matter where I find myself. I can always rejoice in the Lord for those reasons. And there's, you know, a plethora of others. That's just a handful of the reasons we can always rejoice in the Lord. So priority straight. If you want purpose... If you want to get this life right and get it figured out, rejoice in the Lord. Start there. Now, um, he continues on in his message here, his letter. He says, to write the same things to you, to me, indeed, is not grievous, but to you it is safe. In other words, he says, look, we're kind of reiterating this rejoicing thing. And he says, and, and I'm going to reiterate uh, what to reject here in verse 3. He's going to... Um, in verse 2 and 3, he's going to tell us what to reject. And he says, I'm reiterating this, and it's not a problem for me. I'm doing this for your safety, to, as a safeguard, so you get this right. Verse 2, so he tells us what? Beware of dogs. Beware of evil workers. Beware of the concision. What in the world is he talking about there? Well, he's talking about those who are preaching a false gospel that you can actually be good enough to get to heaven. He's, he's saying, reject, beware, uh, uh, push away those who would tell you that you can be good enough to get to heaven. That you can actually perform an act to get yourself to heaven. He says, watch out for those people. They're preaching a false gospel. And he says, beware of, uh, for we are, notice in verse 2, he finishes with, beware of the concision, those who would divide over the true gospel. Look at verse 3. For we are the circumcision. A spiritual group of people. God's people. How? Which worship God in the spirit. You see. And rejoice in Christ Jesus. How? Because we don't have any confidence in the flesh. Do you see that there? Have no confidence in the flesh. Reject any idea that you can be good enough. He says. Get rid of it. He says, and there's even some people who will tell you that once you have by faith received Jesus, there are some who will tell you that now you have to be good to keep Jesus happy with you. Now you have to keep doing right or else God's not going to love you anymore. You can lose it. And if you're not staying on the up and up, why? God's not going to be pleased. Well, who determines exactly what's on the up and up and what's not? Where's the line? We'd all put it in a different place, wouldn't we? And aren't you glad that Jesus didn't save me because I would keep being good, but because he's always good? I can't keep up. And the Bible tells us over and over again, the law is not there to keep us right, it's to show us we're not. And there's one way to be right. And that's what Paul says is what this is all about. Living for the right purpose starts with the right outlook. Rejoicing in the Lord, not in my works. We better get that right. If there's anybody here today who's sitting there thinking that you're going to be moved on up because you're so much better than the average, look out. Beware, Paul says. It's a false gospel. Now, Paul tells us what adherence to, the, to religion looks like. What does adherence to religion look like? Well, you know what it does? It glorifies man, not God. Now, hang with me here. Don't, don't start coming up with all, our, all these arguments against what... Hang with me and, and what Paul says here, okay? We're going to read the Word of God. Adherence to religion glorifies man. And Paul has a pretty awesome record, doesn't he? 
Look at verse 4. He's talking about we shouldn't have any confidence in the flesh. And in verse 4 he says, though I might have confidence in the flesh. Uh, if any other man think that he could, um, I think I could more. I can trust my flesh more than any of you, Paul says. That's a pretty bold statement. It almost sounds like Paul's being a little proud or prideful, doesn't it? He says, hey, folks, if you think you're good, I'm telling you right now, nobody's record can match up to mine. And you say, that sounds proud. Well, he's doing it to prove a point, isn't he? He's, he's going somewhere with this. So look at his accomplishments. Look at Paul's resume. Verse 5. He says, well, I was circumcised the eighth day. As he, as a Jew, as a godly Jew, uh, a male, you were supposed to be circumcised on the eighth day. No ifs, ands, or buts about it. It doesn't matter if there's a snowstorm. Uh, it doesn't matter if the lights won't come on. It doesn't matter if you're not feeling good. A, a male child is to be circumcised on the eighth day. In fact, they took that rule and placed it over the Sabbath rule. They would even circumcise on the Sabbath day. And then a guy who went out and, and got his, his ox out of a ditch, they would say he's sinning, but they were allowed to do that. It just Again, here we go with man's rules, right, and our, our religion. But he says, I was circum- I know some of you were circumcised on the seventh day or the ninth day, eighth day. To you and me, that's not, you're like, so what? No, that's a big deal. That's like saying, I attended such and so church with such and so, such and so pastor led me to the Lord. And Paul says, that's great, but we're all just ministers. Circumcised the eighth day. What else does Paul say? What else is on his resume? Um, of the stock of Israel. I'm not one of those fake Israelites. I'm a real Israelite. In fact, I'm so much of a real Israelite, I can't even tell you which tribe I'm from. Benjamin. Wait, did you say Benjamin? Man, he's a real Jew. He came from Benjamin. To you and I, it's like, what is the big stupid deal? Benjamin was the baby. The favorite. I mean, Joseph, right? But he got beat up. But Benjamin was the child of Joseph's or Jacob's old age. I mean, that was a special gift from God. And he was the smallest tribe. And so if you came from Benjamin, you came from Jacob and Rachel. I mean, whoa. You're big time. That's where this is going. That's that's a big resume in in Paul's circle. I know none of us are impressed, but that's huge. He says, uh, I'm not just a Hebrew. I'm a Hebrew of the Hebrews. I'm not just Baptist. My mom was Baptist when I was in the womb. I was born in a Baptist church, dedicated in a Baptist church, saved in a Baptist church, baptized in a Baptist church. I've never stepped foot in another church. I am in Hebrew of the Hebrews. It's not a big deal to us, right? But for, for Paul, I mean, these people, ooh, all right? As touching the law. You want to see how I treat the law? Hey, I'm a Pharisee. How much of the law do you know, Paul says? Because you know how much of the law Paul knew by memory? All of it. Paul had memorized Genesis through Deuteronomy. I got Genesis (laughs) 1-1. And maybe a few others. Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. You know, I got a couple. He knew the entire first five books of our Bible by memory. He gets a sticker for that one that I don't get. All right. Verse 6. You want to talk about zeal? You want to talk about all-out passion for serving God, Paul says? I persecuted the church. I didn't just stick around and say, I don't like those people. Those Jesus followers. I don't want anything to do with it. No, Paul didn't just stand around and talk about them. Paul went and got them and put them in prison. That's how zealous he was. He was a soul. He was a door knocker. But when Paul came to your door, he wasn't giving you a track. He was giving you shackles. I'm a door knocker every week, Paul says. Touching, verse 6, touching the righteousness which is in the law. You want to talk about records? How I follow the law? Go back and ask anybody who knew me. I never messed up. 
You live with anybody like that? You know anybody like that? You can hardly find anything wrong with them. It just makes you sick, you know? Paul says, that's me. Look at my record. Sunday school, every week. Sunday morning, 11 o'clock, there every time the doors are open. In fact, I was there so early, I beat the pastor. I'm being kind of funny, but, but I'm also trying to prove a point that when we start tallying up, I got this, and boy, God's got to be really happy with me today. I'm at church, and he probably stood up when he saw me pull in the parking lot today, and um, I actually actually brought my Bible this morning, and uh, I remember, you know, I, come on. And Paul says, if you want to talk about records, I can beat all of you. But that, Paul blows that up right away. Verse 7, but what things were gained to me, I counted them loss. Why? Because he found a better religion? Because he found a better way? Because there was a new way of doing it? Because now he's enlightened in those churches back in those old-fashioned churches. They don't get it. We get it. No, that's not what Paul's talking about here. Paul's saying, I found something better than anything I could ever do. And that's Jesus. All that stuff, all of my accomplishments, throw them in the trash. In fact, he uses a little stronger language here in a minute about what he thinks about those accomplishments. Get rid of them, he says. None of that matters to me anymore. All that matters to me, purpose, is Jesus. He is all that matters to me. You can have all the stuff. You can have the records. You can have the zeal. You can have the door knocking trophies. Have it all. I'm focused on Jesus Christ. I want to know him, I want to make him known. And Paul says, that's what I think of my accomplishments. 2 Corinthians 5.21 says, For he hath made him to be sin for us, who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. Do you see the transaction that took place? God took his only begotten son, who had never sinned, and, and had him murdered and sacrificed for all of our sins. He took his wrath out on Jesus Christ so that you and I can have Jesus Christ's record. Not because of what you and I do, but because of what Jesus did. And, and it's because Jesus died and became the sacrifice that you and I are considered by God to be righteous. None of us deserves it, but hallelujah for it. And then what does, say, what does Paul say? The value of religious accomplishment versus knowing Christ based on his accomplishments. This is great. He says he's counting them for loss. And then verse 8, Yea, doubtless, and I count all things but loss. Why? For what? For the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things. He said, I, I've given up nothing in this world, Paul says. No thing in this world matters to me Jesus does I wonder are you there yet this morning and Paul even goes on to say in verse 12 he's not there yet either he's still working on it he's still trying to know Jesus but all that and, and look if you look at the last line there verse 8 he says and I do count them but dung that I may win Christ, that I may gain Christ, that I may know him even more. Paul says, I don't have all of Jesus that I want yet. Did you realize when you get saved, it doesn't all end there? <laughs> when you get saved, that's the beginning of our spiritual walk. That's the beginning of walking in light. That's the beginning of knowing Christ. And then hopefully from there, we have this awesome relationship that lasts until we're in his presence and goes on and on for eternity. It should be a growing relationship with Jesus, not, I got saved and now I'm just doing what I used to do. No, Paul says, I don't have all of Jesus that I want yet. And hopefully that's our heart's attitude also. Hopefully when we get up and we, we open up the word of God, we're, we're, our, our hearts are desiring to know Jesus a little bit more when we read. Or, or when we get up and we pray that we pause for a minute and don't just give our list, although we're supposed to bring our requests, but that we take some time just to love on him and know him. 
and to tell him I love you. And Lord, help me to see you today and talk to me. Tell me what you want me to know, Lord. Hopefully we spend some time trying to get more of Jesus. Everything, Paul says, everything else is worthless when compared to knowing Jesus. I put those things away and focus on gaining Christ more and more. Paul took his resume and put it in the shredder. The greatest accomplishment is to lose my life in his. Listen to this. You want to know how, what success and purpose looks like in this life? Listen to this phrase. Success or finding purpose is not finding out who I am and living it out unashamedly. But it is recognizing who God says that I am in living in that freedom. You see, our world will tell us, live your own truth. You find what makes you happy and do it. Be who you are. Um, if that's how you feel, then that's definitely who you are. And don't be ashamed of it. Find out who you are and live that out unashamedly. That is the wicked lie of the devil that is being perpetrated through the media and our culture today. You just, whatever you feel like doing, you just do it. And, and don't be ashamed of it. Be who you are and be happy with it. And everybody else can just live with it. You love who you are. Have your truth, your version of the truth. Live your truth. Live your best life now. That goes directly in the face of what Paul is saying here. Purpose in, you want to know how, why we don't feel satisfied? Because we're so wrapped up in finding out who we are and what we want and being who we are and accomplishing and being and, and obtaining status, status, status in every aspect of our life. Am I, am I a better husband than my wife is to me? Am I a better parent than brother so-and-so in the church? Am I going up the ladder faster than the other guy? You know, all these uh, things that we try to obtain to make us better. Look, stop it. Stop trying to find out who you are. And recognize who God says you are and live in that freedom. Because that's way better than anything I can get to. God says I'm his child. God says my sins are gone. God says I have a home in heaven. He walks with me. He lives inside of me. And even when, even when I mess it up and sin, he loves me anyway. And you know what? I'm not going to get it right every time. But he loves me anyway. You say, well, that's, shouldn't we try to be right? Verse 9. And be found in him, not having mine own righteousness, which is of the law. Keep track. Make sure you're doing right. Keep track. Make sure. You're, why don't you walk with Jesus? This is a whole other way. We, we have been in, instilled in our hearts and minds that if we don't watch it, We're bad. Guess what? We're bad. And we can come in here and be phony all we want, but we're bad. Fundamentally broken and messed up. And it's only by the grace of God and the love of Jesus that I'm anything. And when I live in that reality, my purpose is to know Him and to make Him known. Well, at Sunday school this morning, I was talking about walking in the light, walking in this world as Christ is in us. Paul says, I want to be found in him, man. I want to be so wrapped up in Jesus that people will look at me and say, hey, you are with him. 
That's what they said of Peter, and he didn't even like it. Remember that? Peter shows up at Jesus' trial. John tried to get him in. He says, no, I'll just wait out here. People said, hey, you're one of his disciples. No, I'm not. Yeah, you were there. I saw you. No, you didn't. Hey, you cut off my uncle's ear. I know it was you. No, I'm not. Peter wasn't even trying. In fact, Peter was betraying Jesus. He was denying him. And somehow, they still recognized that Peter was with Jesus. Why? Because Peter's a good boy. No! Because they saw him with him all the time. And you know what? You and I will be fulfilling our purpose in this life when people look at us and just say, that guy has to be spending a lot of time with Jesus. I, yeah, I know he's denying him right now, but I've seen him with him. It's not about what we're doing for Jesus. It's about what he's done for us. And when we're walking in the light as he is in the light, when we're walking in the light as God is given, not in the darkness of this world, it'll be clear the real purpose in this life is to be found in Christ, knowing him and making him known. Spend so much time with Jesus that people will have seen you together. How about that? And then Paul finishes by saying, there's three ways I want to know him even more. First of all, the power of his resurrection. You see that in verse 10? That I may know him and the power of his resurrection. We all love that. I want to know him and the power of his resurrection. New life, eternal life. That's how we want to know him. But Paul goes somewhere that most of us won't go. He says next, and the fellowship of his sufferings. Wait a minute. Paul understands when Jesus says, if they have hated me, they will hate you. That if you will live for Christ, this world is going to hate you. you. Say, well, then I'm out, man. I don't want nobody. Look, I get it. I don't want to be disliked either. But would you rather know him better or have the world love you? That's what Paul says this all comes down to. Purpose, look, if we're going to live to make them happy, we're not going to be happy. You, you know why? Because you're not living for you, you're living for them. When you live for them, you may make them happy, but you're not going to be. When you live for him, or with him, they're not going to be happy, but you will. I'll trade that. I'll trade that. He says, I want to know him in the fellowship of his suffering. Watch this one. Being made conformable unto his death. I want to be molded into his, not life, not glory. I want to be molded into his death. What in the world, Paul? Paul says, yeah, Jesus didn't live how he wanted to live. He, he said that he only did the things the Father told him to do. And Paul says, in that death to himself brought life to the rest of us. And so Paul says, I want to live like that. I want to live in a way that I'm dead to me and alive in God, and he calls the shots, not me. That's how Jesus lived, conformable to his death, laying down his life. Paul says, I'll lay down mine and let him have it. And he finishes by saying, that by any means he may obtain the resurrection of the dead. He is striving to know Christ and by knowing Christ, by having him as your Savior, the resurrection of the dead is going to be a glorious day when he comes for his own. This life is not about finding out who I am and living it out unashamedly. This life, purpose in this life, is recognizing who God says I am and living in that freedom. If you'd stand with us, please, the musicians would come. God created us for his pleasure and for a relationship with him. I wonder this morning, is what I'm currently living for accomplishing that purpose? Am I living to make them happy? 
Am I living to make others around me happy? Or am I living? Is my purpose, my goal to know Jesus? To know him better every day? To make, uh, to live in him so that he's living through me? So that as I walk through this world, people will look and say, I've seen that guy with God before. Walking in the light. This morning we've explored the most fulfilling purpose in this life, to know and to glorify Jesus. Can you say that's what you're living for? Maybe you're here today and you're not saved. You're not even sure that you're going to go to heaven when you die. You know, a relationship with God comes through Jesus Christ. Jesus died and took your sins upon himself. He took God's punishment for you and gave you the opportunity to be saved from your sins and from hell and to have everlasting life, eternal life. It can be yours if you trust Jesus today. Would you trust him? You just say, Lord Jesus, I know I'm a sinner. And I believe that you died on the cross for my sins. I believe that you died and were buried and you rose again. And I ask you to save my soul and forgive me of my sin. Would you ask him today to save you? If you're here today and you are saved, are you ready to live for God's intended purpose? Aren't you tired of trying to please everybody else? Aren't you try, t- tired of relying on your own resume to make everybody else and maybe even try to make yourself happy? Look, recognize who God says you are and live in that freedom. You're a child of God. They're going to sing, and as they sing, however God has spoken to your heart, respond to him right now.